You're listening to The Vent Podcast, where we bring you interviews and stories from around the world of wine and spirits. From winemakers and critics to sommeliers and master distillers, we'll explore the people and businesses who are instrumental in shaping the future of today's food and drinks culture. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Vent Podcast. My name is Brady, joined, as always, in studio by the wonderful Billy Galanko. How you doing, Billy? Doing very well. Glad to be back for another exciting, sparkling episode this week. We've had Peter Leem on in the past. Yeah, sorry. I was actually trying to talk about sparkling as in like the quality of the effervescence of our conversations and like our, our episodes are sparkling. Yeah, I, I, I didn't realize I didn't come off that way. Yeah, this is our <laughs> 120th sparkling episode by those standards. The very first sparkling wine episode, we have the seventh generation proprietor of Billicart Samon. Mathieu Roland Billicart. Please excuse our French during this episode today. But yeah, it was great connecting with someone who, I mean, not only his like life and his parents' life is deeply connected to wine, which is a lot of our guests actually have a story like that. But for many generations, like my great, 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 great grandfather, as he talks about carrying on a legacy of winemaking is, is super impressive. Yeah, it's one of these sparkling producers that I'm sure everybody or champagne producers that I'm sure everybody's familiar with. They have very unique bottles. They're also one of the pioneers in terms of rosé champagne. So I'm sure everybody's had that that amazing bottling that they have. But yeah, no, it's so interesting that he he makes the point of not only is it family owned, but it's family operated. They've made a point of keeping somebody in the family at the at the helm. And each of these people, he, he goes into how they've had their own imprint on on how the companies run, but yet there's these consistent through lines and values that the, the families had since their founding in the early 1800s. Yeah, I think it was, it was cool. It was a great first, first sparkling from producer, champagne producer to have on, on the podcast. I always like when uh, we get producers to talk about sort of like the purpose of their portfolio and each of their wines at, at each different level. And I thought he spoke really well to why they make the wines that they do, why they release the wines that they do. And at, at each level from their, they call it like their, actually, what did he call it? Not Tête de Cuvée, but their, their top labels. I used oh, to say top like, labels? Yeah. Oh, prestige? Like prestige, or? yeah. Prestige Cuvée. All the way down to, I think their wines maybe start around $60 for their Brut or Brut Nature, maybe $70 for the Brut Nature. But yeah, a really accessible portfolio from top to bottom, I think. And beautiful wines. You mentioned the Rosé Champagne, which is, I always remember them as a producer of fine rosé champagne because I think of the salmon, like salmon, and like the kind of pink, pretty color of that bottle. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's cool. So, Yeah. And it, it was interesting, again, to hear his his impact, what, what, what he is trying to emphasize longer, longer aging of some of the wines or continued long-term aging for some of the wines, but also how they're trying, they're keeping tabs on a changing environment, changing conditions, and how they're there, what was his term about the innovation? I, I loved it. It was like tradition is innovation that works. I think right. something yeah. like that. That worked. Yeah. It's, yeah. So it's basically like they're get, they're continuing to try new things while doing things that have consistently worked well. And I, I just love that that idea that they're keeping one eye. Is it an eye or they're keeping an eye to the past? They're they're definitely respecting their traditions, but they're mm-hmm. they're looking forward to the next generation. He's trying to hand off the company better than he found it to his his family member down the line, which I think is a really cool, cool vision for a company in a while. Yeah, because we, because I mean, obviously they've, they've had many opportunities, I'm sure, to realize the full success of their business and sell it in the past, right? Over seven generations. And they haven't done that. And the only way you're able to sort of exist through that tension and sustain the vision of the company through opportunities where you could have sort of sold out to a larger conglomerate or stepped away from the hands-on is to be really comfortable in that tension between what did we do that worked in the past and what's the tradition and values that we have, but also like, how can we keep innovating? Uh, I think it's super impressive that a privately owned, like still family owned business like that is able to s- still stay at the forefront, forefront. And he talks actually a lot about that, just like sort of the business philosophy side that he brings and the strategy side that he brings to this current generation, which I think he feels like is actually an asset that he brings as opposed to maybe the last couple leaders of of, of the house yeah mm-hmm. yeah his his career was in in finance i think it was or it's some sort yeah. of business capacity 
I say business as if <laughs> everything's not a business, but yeah, I think it was a more of a finance background. But also I love how he also continues to emphasize that quality is their leading uh, driver in terms of advertising. It's like there's there's word of mouth that we keep making good wine. People know you talked about a lot of culinary leaders really spreading the word about their wines, which I thought was cool rather than big flashy ad campaign. And he he makes a good point of not calling out any specific competitors. And I I won't either here, but I think a lot of us can picture these big splashy ad campaigns or some of these producers that are are selling for even more sometimes than be the card, but are produced in like the millions of bottles rather than what he's saying is like they 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 make so much and then and then they sell it and they're not you know drastically expanding production just to meet demand, which is really interesting. Yeah, I mean in the same token, like by any measure, they're still one of the largest and most widely distributed champagne producers in the world. I mean, you see their wines all over the place in the US, as opposed to just say like Grover Champagne or other smaller producers. So they're they're still by any measure, very large, extremely successful, wide distribution. But it's cool to see still how they're able to draw very clear sort of distinguishing lines between them and some of the other top houses. Even though some of those houses are producing many multiples more cases than they are, they're still very large. And so the fact that they're still able to participate at the top of the market while drawing very clear distinctions between them and competitors is, yeah, it's not something you always see at the top of a market. Usually it's just, oh, everything's the same and I buy this brand because that's just what I've always bought. But that's not, yeah, sort of not their story. Yeah. Yep. So that, I mean, I don't think there's there's much more from from my side to say. It sounds like it's a really, there's a really bright future for, for Abilicard. And I, I love how he's just continuing to keep an eye on the past. And he's still talking to his, I think it was his, technically his cousin. who was, great uncle. Was one, or great uncle. Yeah. His cousin led the company before, and then the great uncle was before mm-hmm. him. And then he was complaining about, not complaining necessarily, but noting how they're trying to manage ripeness now in this day and age. And the guy was just like, ha, like back in my day, we were constantly worried about to getting, ripen. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't get anything to ripen. So he's like, ah, stop, stop whining. Like I, that's, that's such fun conversations to have within, within your own family. And then the other, the other part that he ends up touching on is I, I like the honesty and the transparency. We asked him about back vintages and he was just like anything before World War II was taken by the Germans. And then my, my great uncle didn't, didn't really believe that. He just wanted to, after the war, just get as much, make great wine and, and sell it as quickly as you can. So he's, it's not that we couldn't have aged those wines. They were age worthy. It's just the model was just to sell everything back then. So that is why. And it's like that, that makes complete sense. You could have come up with some story about why why there isn't or why they're doing it now instead of before but i think that was really great and direct yeah for sure yeah and talks talks a lot about the commitment that they have to aging on the lees while some of their compet that's one of the big differentiators right some of their competitors have over time just like cut in half and cut in half again the time in which they age their wines on the lees and they've maintained a commitment to long ease lees contact and as we'll talk, and if you're not familiar with that concept, I think we talk about it a little bit on the on the episode, but it's certainly a, a pretty significant differentiator in quality sometimes between these producers. Yeah, definitely tangible, tangible ways that they're maintaining quality over time. If you want to learn more about the Lee's aging, look at it, listen to episode 75 of the Vint podcast with Peter Lee. Nice. He definitely touches on it a bit. Yeah, just wanted to give that plug. <laughs> awesome. Glenn, uh, we'll jump right into the episode. Here is CEO and seventh generation proprietor of Billicart, Simon Mathieu Roland Billicart. We are here with Mathieu Roland Bicart. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, this was. Really exciting. This is our first champagne producer to come on the podcast. We've had Peter Lehm on in the past to talk about champagne as a category, but we're really excited to to have you and learn all about what you're what you guys are doing over there and more about your family actually as well. Could you start out maybe giving a little background on on the Roland Bicard family and kind of just how your your house came to be over the years and, and where you guys are today? I know it's a long, long history, but maybe the, the summarized version. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. Yeah, thank you. Look. The story all began in 1818 when my great, 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 great grandfather, a gentleman called Nicolas Francois Billicott, married a lady called Elizabeth Samuel, who's my great, great, great grandmother. Both the Billicott and the Samuel family has been in, been in, the, in the village I'm in right now since at least the 16th century. 
and they were a mix of sort of wine warriors, merchants. So it was a different world back then. And basically, over the last two hundred and five years, we are one of the very last few producers that has managed to keep it family owned and family run. So I'm several generation from that marriage. We've been passing all the back end over the last two hundred and five years, on on since twenty eighteen that I've had battle nets logged on my desk. Awesome. And and you didn't start out carrying the baton. You did your own you had your own career and then you came into the, the family business. Is that right? That's right. I'm quite independent and strong minded. So I, I was born and bred here. I'm a champagne boy. Uh, I'm very proud to be. Um, but when I was 20, I decided I didn't speak English well enough. And because I'm a very slow learner, I spent 17 years learning English. And when I was ready, I came back. No, perhaps more, more, uh, more seriously. My cousin Francois had run the estate for 25 years. Worked a great job. But when he turned 70, he said, look, this is the time where we need to look and look a little bit out. And I got a phone call and it was a, it was a, this, this a question over, do you want to be the seventh generation to lead the house? And it's one of these questions that quite it's a, it's a simple question. It, it takes a bit of thought, but it's a very hard question to say no to. So I've been like, the, that, that, it's really curious how you talked about the, being one of the few houses that are still family owned. And you, you use the word you said we uh, managed to stay family owned. What are so what are the what are the uh, there are some obvious temptations of sort of selling to a larger conglomerate and sort of taking that not the easy way out, but a there's you can see the light at the end of the tunnel when you take that <laughs> that that option out. What what are some of the other like when you when you say manage to stay family owned? What are some of the other challenges that exist with navigating that amongst these other producers? I think you're, you're right. And one of them is yourself. And I think the main one that's, I would say the one that's the most frequent recently is greed is the one that basically brings that link. For you generation that stop to decide they're custodian of somebody's heritage and decide to basically cash in. So that's quite a frequent way of breaking the bond. I think historically there has been a lot of accidents. We, we've had to live through the two world wars. I mean, not me personally, obviously, but the family and, and the region was very heavily affected. So sometimes that has broken the organization, but ultimately it's a company, it's to make money. Um, so that's been a big pitfall. Also epidemics and things like that. We didn't, we didn't have COVID, but there's been very bad things like Spanish flu and Connor. If you look far enough back, there's these sort of societal challenges are obviously led certain organizations to fall away. And in any companies, like also bad decisions, sometimes a house that was a house that was particularly strong and bright, particular time, um, I don't know, somebody made the wrong decision, went into the wrong market, locked it off. So I think the, the three of them, as over the last 200 years, certainly being big reasons, I would say more or laterally. And fortunately, the first one, greed, is is the most common to to break uh, the link because obviously, champagne market is much more established. Recognition also is much stronger. Even if you put one knee down very quickly, you will create an alliance. There's enough investors kicking around. So that's the reason why when I say managed is yes, it's a pride. It's a pride and it's a commitment. There are still quite a few also quite well, quite. There are more family-owned businesses than there are family-run businesses. Where we are very proud of the family is not only do we own it, but we get our hands dirty uh, because we strongly believe, and that was really a decision the family made when, when I was appointed, and if you really want your values to be lived and breathed every day, you cannot really delegate the management to a third party person. No matter how competent this person is, this is not criticism of, of, of other people who are I'm sure technically much brighter and smarter than me on how to do their things. But if we wanted to run the bill of way, it has to be a bill of family member. It's a little bit like when you go to a restaurant and the chef owner is there every day. Teams stand a bit straighter. Maybe the knives are aligned a bit more. Attention to detail is a bit more. That's not to say it can't be done any other way, but it is our way. And, and we believe that bill of power sound more by the, by the house. Produces that sort of quality wine and, and is that precise in that distribution. 
far, not only, but partly because of that family owned and family run combination. It's, it's sound, sounds like now as the se- seventh generation, you have to so- sort of strike a really delicate balance between maintaining the values and the heritage and the historical heritage of the estate with the, as I'm sure to you, like daily present fact that you're running a business that needs to grow, needs to innovate in certain ways, needs to do things like sales. <laughs> Right. And um, is is that does uh, maybe does that become more challenging over time, the older the business gets to ma- continue that balance? And, and where do you yeah, how do you how do you think about that tension? It's a difficult one. I think I think some of that comes down to mindset of, for, for the family. We have this we have many sales in the family. And one of them is we say that tradition is an innovation that's worked. So for us, and one element that will help you answer the question from a thematic perspective, our family motto, we have a couple, but one of the main one is give priority to quality and thrive for excellence. That sounds horrible in, in modern day and age. Kind of like the thing that would be the worst strap line ever. The birthday. Because it's so old and so enshrined in what we do, actually, yes, it does look or it does sound dated, but it is actually want to look at once you, you actually use it, what does that mean? That means we have to constantly challenge ourselves to do better. Some of that comes down to tradition. So some of that is about being sufficiently confident about what you do today, not to change every time somebody comes up with a new flag. You've just seen a picture on Instagram. Okay, great. But, but it is still challenging yourself to try and do better all the time. And that's where I don't believe sometimes people feel like to innovate, they need to exalt tradition in the past. I, I don't believe in that. I think you need to constantly build on what you have had. Know that sometimes things become obsolete, but in our line of business, right, me, wine has been made for millennials. People that say that they make an innovation in wine, they need to go on a humility course. It's all relative. Innovation in wine no. is still a great, gets pricey, gets fermented. Yeah, the variations are very small. However, it's not because they're not very small, you should challenge yourself to do better. So we are very comfortable with that, that yes, we're a traditional house by heritage, but the reason why our wines are, well, I'd be very top of what can be done in the final champagne being produced is also because we know we can't stay and basically rest on our laurels and say, okay, it'd be great for 200 years, Let's do nothing and keep doing like my grandfather or my great grandfather. In reality, making great wines today, we face very different set of challenges that might run with it. And that's fine. However, the know-how and the culture around the company to have a strong desire and a clear purpose to produce the final champagne stays. So challenges change, but fundamentally, the squad that goes after it is a cost. I love I love the saying that tradition is innovation that works. My my college had a, a saying that was like creating new traditions every day, which was a horrible version of what you guys have. <laughs> but uh, can you list a little bit of those, or maybe highlight a few of those challenges that you're you guys are currently facing, or a few of the innovations that maybe have happened over the past couple of decades, and and you guys are working on now to adapt and, and- to straight the like tradition is innovation that work. All our cuvées now are. Uh, Cold ferment, meaning we do a cold fermentation for the yeast to transfer sugar into alcohol. That's something that my great uncle wrote in the 1960s. It's now one of the clear vector of the blood class and long difference. In the US, I mean, and I think also globally, we're particularly well known for our Brut Rosé. Once we've been making Brut Rosé since at least 1840, that's the earliest writings of a customer asking for more. The recipe, the approach, the blending philosophy that we're using today is in 19. 19- 60s innovation. So again, that's two. A lot of these things are, 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 are like that, and they don't date back to 1818. That's just a reality. If you look at the challenge today, mostly now it's more to do with vine growing than it is to do with winemaking. Well, of course, there are tiny differences, but, but I, don't, I don't think we want to get that technical. But on the vine growing front, there are two elements. One is transparency. I think our bill crack followers and the most expert customers want to know much more about the vine work. I think that's fine. 
often not with the same amount of knowledge to be able to judge the subtleties. So that's one of the different because they have a lot of very set views because they read a book. But we live in it every day. So I think there are differences between the theory and practice. However, I think the requirements for the greatest accountability is right. And I think that's the right challenge for us to have. And maybe I've made a lot of changes in the last five years a lot. And the other one is obviously the change in weather pattern, but that's always been the case. In truth, what the challenges we face today, like I tell my great uncle who's 101 years old, that my challenge is over ripeness and lots of acidity. And he basically laughs because he, for most of his life, his challenge was to get the grapes to maturity. And he just said, look, get, get, get a life. So challenges, I think there's no point mooning that they are there. They are there. We must be confident that we've got to overcome them. I think the people in Lemon in Wine is often ignored in the day and age. Everybody talks about nature. I think Fantastic Wine is, of course, about nature, but it is about balancing people and nature. That, that is what makes the greatest wines. And once again, that culture of challenging ourselves to be better. And so for us, that means I converted our own vineyard to organic. We are now on our second years of trials in biodynamic. I balance. Across all our sourcing, we use a wick killers. We don't use any kind of fertilizers or, or chemical fertilizers. So there are a lot of things that sounds easy to do, but actually they're quite hard to put in practice. But I don't like also to do the ones that what I find is one of the issues in Champagne is a lot of talk and a lot of very glossy pictures, but not as much action as there are photographs. So I prefer to do big fundamental changes, accepting that sometimes these Changes are slower to put in place, but I don't like trying to find short-term buzzy fixes to a long-term problem. I think that's that may please the media community. I think it's a wrong solution. So uh, I'm not getting involved in this. And once again, being fan, really own and run gives you a very different perspective of fun. That's our greatest luxury. My, my job spec is run your crop cell more in a way then I can give the keys of the company to the eighth generation in a, in a better shape that I found it. And I found it in a good shape. So that enables you to challenge yourself to do the right thing for the long term, not just short term fixing. That's a great perspective. Sounds like you, I mean, simultaneously have to think a ton about, ton about the past, obviously a whole lot about the present. And then even more, you have to think about the future too. You mentioned the eighth generation. I think that's yeah, something I hadn't even... <laughs> started to think about as we're listening. That's great. Let's let's zoom back out and can you walk our listeners through the current current portfolio and, and some of the wines that you're making currently and maybe how to say this, what the purpose of each of those wines are in the market and, and sort of how yeah, how how they sort of display the estate in those ways. Yes. So I've now I like to think about our range of wines a little bit like a vineyard. So pruning sometimes is necessary. So I've been pruning a little bit the range to focus on what we're very good at. I mean, there's been at the margin changes, but now I think of what we do in four different savoir-faire. Savoir-faire meaning no house, not a good translation, but is what is it we're very good at? And we we can say, if somebody says, I like that kind of wine, we want to say, yeah, that's, we've got something to say there. Not just we do it. We do it and it's, it's bloody good. Um, so the four categories are the wondrous behind me. So the traditional blend savoir faire. So for somebody that think about champagne, traditional blend is different grape varieties blended together in several years. So that's the must do if you're a house of champagne. You, you need to have one of them. And we declined it into Brut Reserve. So all of my savoir faire have a a non-vintage version and a vintage version. So Brut Reserve for the non-vintage and Nicolas Francois for our Prestige Cuvée. So that's the oldest Prestige Cuvée and it bears the name of my great, 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 great grandfather. So again, that's where tradition is respected. So traditional blend, which everybody would know that we do. Rosé is the second slug right there. So that's what we do with Brut Rosé and for the Prestige version, Elizabeth Samuel, my great, 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 great grandmother. So these are the two, I would say, the best known ones because they are the oldest one. And then we have two others. One, what we do in Blanc de Blanc. So Blanc de Blanc, I'm not sure whether your list was familiar, but that means champagne made only from white grapes. And white grapes in champagne is Chardonnay. And at Rive Cartelmont, we only 
And we can use ground crew, which is very, very rare. And ground crew from one subset called Code de Blanc, the heel of the white. And I could keep up with you, York Chardonnay. So on this one, we do a Blanc de Blanc, not vintage, and we do a Louis Salmon, who is a brother of Elizabeth Salmon, we'll get go back to tradition. And last but not least, the fourth savoir faire is what we do in barrel fermented white. And here we have the Brut Chouac, which is three grape varietal, but vinified in the Bourbon du Nord barrels. And we have a super special one, which is the Close Antilles, which is a very old parcel we have at the heart of the estate, which is single grape varietal, single vineyards, the world vineyard, very old, and barrel fermented. Four types of cuvee, four savoir faire, and each of them have two bottling. On the different types of bottlings, back in, back in history a little bit more, making a rosé champagne was a little bit more difficult because of getting the, the right ripeness in, in the red grapes. Um, you guys have obviously been doing that for decades. Have you been seeing that either become easier or I guess, I, I guess how, how has the rosé been ma- making, been changing? And also there's been a, a large rise in demand for rosé wines in general over the past 20 25 years. How, yeah. how, have the, how has that impacted your, your portfolio? I think that's or, for, I mean, look, Rosé for the first 180 years of our life was a chore, but we've always been good at it because it's, it's one of the hardest wine to make because you need to make, it's more complicated than white champagne. And t- between 1840 and 1960, we were making a skin contact Rosé. Uh, I'm not sure we want to go into the technicalities, but when my great uncle decided to reinvent the Bill Craft Sandal Rosé of today, he moved to a blended rosé, meaning, meaning we make our own red wine, which we blend into a, a white wine. And at that stage, between the 1960s and the 19, like, late 1980s, rosé champagne was a very, very niche category. And we, and, and, and probably another house, have been the main proponents of developing that category. And we've been very, we've been held by Top, top chefs in France. So the likes of Van and the likes of Paul Rocuse, the likes of Michel Guerra. So we are talking the godfathers in many ways of French modern gastronomy said, no guy, yeah, you don't like champagne rosé, but try this. This is Bill and you're going to love it. And really there has been the start of the development of this. And now it's yeah, become much more of a, of a category, but Bill was one of these houses that were leading the way. In what had been before, I mean, even even late, late 80s, 90s, I mean, it was tough. It was tough to get it going. And it, from late, late 90s onwards, I think there has been a big acceleration. And then many more houses have joined the party, which is good. That means it's working and, and, and it's good that um, champagne fans have, have choices. What do you think the hesit- hesitancy has been around rosé champagne? And how important is the color? <laughs> but I think <laughs> or, rosy, the... rosy wines and rosy wines in general. I mean, even growing up uh-huh. here, including that rosy was the wine you'd have if you go for a bad pizza, you'd be having the rosy champagne, and there would be mm. the one. It would be I think one the rosy wine. Sorry, why why was it seen this way? Probably because on the whole, the quality could have been there. I'm guessing. Not, not in our case, but that's been, that would have been the, I guess, in the reason. And then sometimes marketing helps push that along. But in our case, no, we don't do advertising. We don't do big pushes. So I can't say this is the reason. That's why I mentioned the chefs. They were the ones that I guess in their desire to demonstrate to their clients that they could identify something a little different yet of the greatest quality. And we were. I mean, we're still not very, very well known as compared to the houses that belong to the big luxury conglomerates, but we were even less well known then. They were able effectively to, I don't know, it's like, it's like finding the golden nugget. You don't know it, and I'm going to prove to you it's exceptional. That's also the job of the chefs, and, uh, and they did a great job with us, and they really helped us. Yeah, I, I remember reading a book. I think it was actually by, a, he's now more than a sommelier, but Andre Houston Mack, about, how the sommeliers in the early 2000s used to drink rosé and it was like the cool hip thing that only the Psalms knew about. And now rosé is everywhere. And I guess the same same kind of translates over for that. No, it's, not, it's, not, it's not as dynamic. It's not that dynamic a category it was now. I think Blonde Blonde is the thing. It, it, look, it comes and goes. I mean, we have 
multiple more demand that we have production capacity anyway. We recognize for this category, a lot of people love it. I much prefer in a way sometimes where there is not too much short-term fads and hype around things. I prefer when things are more established. Mm -hmm. That way, you, you are also able to judge making the difference between the average producers and the good producers. When everybody's trying to buy something, it's getting a bit crazy. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Did you, have you seen, so I guess we, we read everywhere in the news that sparkling wines have, have been the most popular, one of the most popular categories recently. Did you guys, have you seen a big shift since pre-pandemic and post-pandemic? And, and have you seen any like differences in markets transitioning or what have you guys been seeing in terms of the macro market for champagne? So there is a champagne market story and there is a Bill Cross Animal story. In a nutshell, the, the, the champagne market story is stable. COVID hits, gets a catastrophic fall. And then post COVID, it's post World War. Everybody's drinking champagne. And, and that's coming, that's coming, not crashing, but champagne market overall lost 10% against last year. Okay. So that's basically normal, full, Magic rise for hopefully stabilized right world before, but we don't know. Bill Cross is a very different story. Stable pre COVID, very surprising, and but also a testament of what we've been saying. We've always had more demand than supply, and we sold exactly the same number of bottles in 2020 than in 2019. Customer loyalty really shone through, where nobody we very strong in hotels and restaurants. Basically, people arrived there, retailers, and said, Look, I want to buy some Bill Cross, yeah. and I've had many customers on this, and they gave me the story, and, and retailers didn't st stop us saying, well, I don't have Bill Cross, but I have brand X, Y, Z, and it's not really, not really understand. I only drink that. I'm not drinking now. So we have a great, we have a great loyalty of our customers, and we work very hard at it. Then when the market sort of everybody wants to buy champagne, yes, yeah, great, but my production is limited. So I'm not able to follow that growth. And equally, when the market corrected last year, it might have stand like the same or sold the same number of bottles in 23 and 22. So we're a little bit, I don't know whether we protected. We need to be very humble about it with market changes. But what was unusual with the post-COVID world is normally you always have a region in the world or a channel that's going a little bit less well. And you need to read out and to market that one more. That gives us around this time of the year. That's what we do. We give an annotation to a certain zone, a certain channel with a certain set of bottles and format and QA. And over the course of a month or so, we can have a little bit more of that, a bit less of that. That's happening in 23. In 21 and 22, every single market wanted more of everything, regardless of what it was. It was crazy. Well, where we need to differentiate the producers is we are very very, very focused on our aging ratio, making sure our wives are aged properly to preserve their quality. Some producers are somewhat less disciplined. So a lot of demand reduces aging. Not demand, aging growth. You look at us, if you look at our vintage cuvee at the moment, we're selling the 2008 and 2009. A lot of producers are selling their 2015. So if you need, for me, there are plenty of things that define quality and that define discipline. But if you need one KPI, look at that. And again, you, I go back to my original thing. I can do that because I'm family owned and run and my family is prepared to take a long-term vision on preserving our family name, which is on, a, on the bottle, because our reputation is not grounded in fluff and, 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 and flashy nightclubs and partnerships with film stars. It's grounded into a top quality wine and a top quality wine requires several things, great viticulture, great know-how, but very important champagne or respectful aging on the leaves. And, and that is something we have to do as a producer. Sometimes some people should remember that a bit more. Yeah. It's sort of drawing a, a contrast between, I'm sure some of the other larger houses in Champagne. I, from a distance to me, Champagne feels like a region amongst the top producers where there's a lot of sort of looking over the shoulder, a lot of competition. Is that a fair assessment of what, what is sort of the culture of your part of the industry? Or like, how would you describe the relationship you have with some of the other top houses who have broad global distribution? Is that something you can speak to? 
I would say no one was on the world is good. And I mean, there is competition, but it's pretty, it's not a bad competition. Rising tide lifts all ships, maybe, or? And I think certainly, and a lot of these being done on the big and small thing, but the argument I told you about aging is as much about the small producers than the big producers. If anything, a lot of the smallest producers have the shortest aging. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there is that obvious divide, the luxury conglomerate and that poor old, very small producer. In reality, no, I think you have serious producers that care truly about quality, even if that means not optimizing their profit. Okay. And that, okay, that's largely in the medium to small category, admittedly, but largely doesn't mean only. And you have the guys that, frankly, they would do champagne as they would do canned beans. They don't care. They're there to make money. Or, or sometimes they would say, my clients don't see the difference in quality, which I found extremely insulting. Tell them, look, if you can, what do you think your customers are? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think it's, and also you have to, we have to understand, we at Bill and, and probably there are, and sort of producers like us, we cater for a certain part of the market. The customers that is there in a um, nightclub at 3 a.m., the argument about quality, I don't think is as personal in their choice of buying a brand or not. That's one example. If you go to a football match and there are like 25,000 people and people are going to be drinking champagne to spray it on the winner, how important is the quality discussion? Well, similarly, the Browns are going to do a partnership with a singer. I'm a singer, singer. Are they buying the wine or are they buying the partnership? You see, a lot of this is very different. The brands that sell themselves in supermarkets, it's, it's a price driven choice. And if you're a low price discounting, you can't do top quality like that. So within the champagne market, you have a lot of different strategies. A lot is being glossed over with many brands pretending. They are luxury products where you can find them in any supermarket. Mm. I find that extraordinary that customers are not picking up a person and saying, oh, wait a minute, that's not possible. But they managed to do it. They managed to do it because they are have very powerful advertising and marketing strategy. I don't have any of that. My marketing strategy is to make great quality wine, to be very respectful of my established clients so that I don't need to get many more new clients a year. And play the long term game with the people relationship. On the whole, that has served as well. It may not be, it's not the most innovative strategy. It's not the most clever strategy. But it's a hard strategy because it's a strategy of discipline. It's a strategy of doing the small things right every day. So it's a no cheating strategy. That's tough. But I have, I have the luxury of my family. I don't have a shareholder that says, look, this is all right. Interesting, your chat that you got. You need to get that percentage in that box, otherwise you are. And, and that, that's the reality. If I didn't have that bedrock of heritage and long-term vision, I wouldn't be able to do the cross and more as good a wine as it is today. And in that category, there are very few players. So I just need to continue to convince or continue to seduce my existing clients that Bill Farr is different and Bill Farr is quote-unquote better, even though it's an always a hard one to judge on, and, and quality is always a relative measure. But if you look at the history I gave you about what happened during COVID and all, well, on the whole, we must be doing something okay. Yeah. So I'm personally a big fan of wines or champagne specifically that see extended lees aging. How do you, have you guys tried to do, obviously we work in wine, have you guys tried to do some education around the benefits of this? And and I don't know, do you guys also do longer term for your non-vintage as well? Or is it just really extended for some of these vintage ones? So and we, we have spent a considerable amount of time. I'm now on my third opus of Brut Reserve. So Brut Reserve, which is our entry, I don't like the term entry level, but it's the starting point price-wise, is going to have gained one year extra aging. Since I took oh, over the last five years. And that despite the, I guess, the behemoth demand that we had. So you talk about discipline, everybody shortened their aging, mine increased by one year. So it is critical for me in the quality equation, long aging only, and also respecting 
in our vision, six months minimum uh, between disgorgement and consumption. Nice. I sell my bottles. You, you'll see now we have a, a full tracking system called My Origin that gives you the details about all these stuff, plans and disgorgement. So for me, it's paramount. That's also why in our prestige QVs, we are eight and nine. We're launching the 12th in April. But I don't believe prestige QVs in Champagne, everybody, every serious producer would have told you 10 years ago, 10 years minimum. Recently, the accountants must have won the argument because surprisingly, it's gone to seven or six. It's only that. I don't think wine has changed that much. But clearly, accountants and marketing departments have won the argument, but not yet. Yeah, yeah I, I've actually noticed that. I, I've been curious. I was like, I, because when in my early wine studies, they always said baseline 10 years for a vintage champagne. And now I've, I'm like, hmm, I guess I, I, I always just will, chalk it up to ripeness. The yeah, I mean, I think there will be an argument in the future when you're talking about vintage 2020, for example, with that level of ripeness. It would be a fair challenge to ask ourselves, hmm. is it still the right movement, the peak maturity on lease? Okay. I don't have the answer to this question, but I can understand theoretically and academically why we can ask ourselves. I have no sympathy for that argument on 2008, 2012, 13, 13 years in October, where you're talking about global warming. Okay. <laughs> that, that's so maybe there will be a time for shortening, but I personally, for my wine, I don't know about the other people's wine, I take them, but I didn't make them. I know that I'd be up now, I can find no quality argument to shorten it right now. Yeah. I, and so I can see the breakage point probably from 18. Technically, I can see 18, we need to challenge and see. But right now, I'm launching my 12s in 24. Well, yes. So uh, again, how do you explain this to a, a consumer who maybe, maybe it's somebody who's, you're trying to get going from that the starting point up to the, the vintage. Do you try to frame it as, as time is quality or without going into all the nuance of what's actually happening on the lease? Or are you going and saying, we get this depth of flavor from what's happening on the autolysis and all that? To, to, be, to be honest, we, we don't do it. We don't go into that level of technical. A lot of our prestige QVA on allocations with people that take every single vintage. So they buy real car because they know it's great. Even when the vintage is not overhyped like 2007. If we release a Nicolas Francois, a Louis Salmon, Elizabeth Salmon, it's because our tasting committee, we believe, is worthy of releasing. We don't release every year. So not only we age longer, but we don't release every year. So I think we are. Frankly, we have plenty of confidence on if we say it's worthy of being called Nicolas Francois, okay, it's worthy of being called Nicolas Francois. Do you prefer one vintage over the other? Yeah. Because they all have different characteristics. So I, I, I think we so therefore we don't, we try not to fall into that thing because what's these aging experiments, so is viticulture, so is vinification, so is forms. However, I don't think customers, or sorry, my customers are not fools. They can read and they can see that they can find Nicolas Francois 2008 and where other cuvées are on 15, 16. They, I think they, the, the, the good thing with my customer base is on the whole, they're smart people. We cater for uh, a global elite of food and wine lovers. So they are the 1% within the 1%. They are the people that I want Excel the intelligence to tell them, oh, look, let me explain to you why it's better. They open the bottle, they taste. If they like it, they're going to purchase it and purchase one more bottle. And that's what my customers attempt. So we need to be disciplined. Don't treat them like idiots. And hopefully, they will continue to respect us. And rightly, for now, it's holding up. I think sometimes people are trying to be not clever, but they try to outsmart their client base. I, I, I would hate somebody doing that to me. Base principle, I try not to give them the next words. I just tell them what it is. And, and that's what I bet was. Taste. The only thing I can add then with a lot of humility is before you say you don't like this try. The ranch, if they tell me I prefer that producer next door, so I tell them, 
therefore buy the other. There's no point. You can't fake taste, taste and emotion. You can't. Yeah, we're pretty simple with that. And the reason why we are don't want that to come across as overconfident, but we've been around too long. To you know that if you want loyalty, it can't be based on, on an unbalanced or a fake argument. If you want loyalty, you need to make sure somebody genuinely has the desire and, and gets an emotion from tasting the other car. It can't be because of their own palate. It can be because of the moment they first had it. It can be a lot of different things. That's why we do the full savoir-faire is because we know whilst we think we describe them as a global elite of food and one of us. The three of us have all different tastes, and that's fine. And therefore, and also at different time of the year or different celebrations, we also like a minimum of diversity. So my full savoir faire enables people to say, it's a bit like a restaurant. Yes, you love the restaurant, but you're not going to take a lobster every time. And you wouldn't like sometimes having the steak or having the, the oysters or, 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 or the pizza, right? So... We can't be uh, a jack of all trades and therefore try to pretend we're good at everything. And right now we focus these four things where we believe we're very thin. Are we the best? Each palette and each person needs to define what's the best for them, but we just hope to be one of the options. What do you say about the opportunity, maybe across your lineup, but specifically with your vintage wines for bottle aging long term? Do you see a great benefit in that, or what, what's your what's your perspective? Again, it depends on personal taste, but we were stu- we are stupid good. I mean, our 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 cold fermentation gives the wine a stronger acidic backbone and more freshness. Mm-hmm. So frequently, we win lineups on the wall, on the wall, not win, but we feature very highly on all the all the wines. It has a, it has a disadvantage for us. I think that cold fermentation means we must keep we must settle it later. And the wines on release can appear a little shy. So, bill price is never an in-your-face taste. Right? It, it is quite subtle, but with time, the, the roses, the flower blossoms, whether it's your taste, if you like mature champagne and you like to age your champagne 10, 20, 30 years, I, I would, if you're that kind of customer, I would strongly recommend them they try us once. You see, if you are the more net poor and gold, maybe there are more obvious choices, but we try and balance that by the fact that our own aging is longer. So if I think if we were releasing our Nicolas Francois at six years, I think there would be a fair challenge on saying, so what, actually, what, what does that one get? At 12, I think I've already done quite a lot of the job along the way, but the time post disgorgement, if we get a little technical here, is a very different aging set than the time on leaves. And, and that is a difficult watch. So for me, when I decide to release a cuvee, like when we sell on 12 or Elizabeth sell on 12, we're going to release in, in, in the spring. For me, it's a little bit like the, if you have children, you raise your children and there is a point at which they're 21, 22. You've taught them, not everything, but you've taught them enough that they just need to do it on their own. You need, you need to let go, and, and, and that's where the point where we release these prestige cuvées, we feel they are at the beginning of their tasting story. But Vinny will say, I like it on release, I'll, I like it after five years, and you like and Brady, you say you like it after 20. At that stage, unless I release it, you don't have the choice. So we need to cut, we need to cut it at some point, and, and that's, where, that's how we, we think of it. But in terms of your original question, if you like that fruit of taste, then yeah, Bill Castle on prestige for sure are built to last 10, 20 or 30. If I don't believe they can age 10 or 20 minimum, they're not, they're not a prestige QA and they don't get released. Do you keep a pretty sizable stock of back vintages from like previous releases at the estate or within your family? Well, How- my generation does. My great uncle who lived through the Second World War. He sold everything. So first, before 45, the Germans took virtually everything. So we have nothing mm-hmm. before 45. My great uncle, different generation, different people's expectation. He didn't keep much. Francois, my pretty sensor, so sixth generation, did in the latter part of what's time. From the early 2000s, he started to stack a bit more aside. But we didn't have... The people that have... When you see a lot of bad vintages coming out of Champagne, or in part, perhaps I'm being too blotchy, either 
you're one brand and you have the full cycle of creating that market. There's only one. It's very big and powerful. Most of the others are basically because they didn't sell their vintages. It, was it wasn't a strategy to keep them just because they didn't. We were neither. We didn't have the foresight to anticipate that market. But our prestige QV is not least because they represent a very, very small percentage. They represent 2% of what we do. They've always sold very well. So we were not neither smart, but equally, we were not anticipating it. We were smart enough to sell what we had to sell, but not smart enough to anticipate the demand of any other. Yeah. Since we're, we're getting closer, close to time here, I was just wondering what you're your future, what you're looking at now, like what, what are some things that you guys are starting to implement now that are really going to come online and impact, continue to impact the quality of the wines in the next five, five, 10 years? So one, I mentioned the one that the aging I've mentioned that I've done it, you have yet to see it because it's everything. We are working on the wines of 23, which you're going to see between 28 and 38. So the additional aging in turn, it will be the changes I've made in terms of viticulture. So organic, we've built now certified. We are trying biodynamic with one of our partner estate in the Loire Valley, a gentleman called Jérôme Gautrodeau, who is one of the king of that. So that will take time for you to filter into that. So all that effort in the vineyard as it go a longer inertia is we need to do it. We need to make the wine, bottle the wine, and get released. If you think about how long does it take for the biodynamic Animals to, to filter into the quality of the wine. In truth, nobody knows. If you move away from marketing, the conversion to organic, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's tasteable within the market. Yeah. But like, there's not a progress there. So if, if that is making a difference, then you will, you will gauge that a bit later. And the last one, which I guess is, is one of the hot issue is it, been around transparency. Yeah. Uh, I think I mentioned it at the beginning. Our clients asked. Uh, I think it's, it's a generation thing. They want to know what's in the bottle. For an old time champagne producers, they were saying that's like a magic recipe, like a fairy ride makes it out. That doesn't really work anymore. So we, we spent, I spent a lot of time having a, a, a transparency system, which we call my origin. Each bottle will have a six digit code. And, and you go on our sign and we'll get you the exact blend. They'll tell you the youngest harvest, oldest harvest what vinification we use, whether it was biotinented, and still, the dosage, the, the disgorgement dates, all of that stuff. That's something that's quite time consuming. It's not what, it doesn't change the quality of the wine, but it, I think it helps if it needs it further enhance Bill Card's reputation because there are very few producers that do this because often there is a disconnect between what the sales one tells you and what's actually going on. But once you write into a system, that that's all the luxury you have and that, and I like that kind of stuff because that's, that's also very consistent with our ethos of every day reading the barn and the ball. Yes. Okay. We do it already, but now we know we rate the an inch higher, jump higher next time. And I, I like that. That's, that's also how we keep things interesting for, for the team is, okay, let's get priority strike for excellence stuff. How do we make it happen? Okay. We make it happen by challenging ourselves to be better every day. There's nothing, nothing that could be challenged like this. Awesome. What, one last question before we let you go. I know it's going to be completely subjective, but what is one of your, or you can list a couple if you want, personal favorite pairings with, whether it be, you can maybe pick one for your rosé and one for your, your Blanc de Blanc or the fruit. So I can't get that by the fact that we are super fortunate that we eat in the best restaurants in the world. So I'm not going to right. even tell you the, the thing that the top chefs did. They do things brilliantly. Yeah. Let's not go into that. Just your so, personal favorites. Yeah, I would say more that it's not guilty pleasure, but it's the kind of thing once you've traveled and once you're happy to get room, what is it the thing you think you're getting? Like sushi, take away sushis with good rosé or take away pizza with good rosé. I think it's a killer on Friday night. Like you'd be running around, it is great thing. And on our group chivois, so the one we vinified barrels, that and Conte cheese. So these are lazy. How do you make what it, what is simple, like a takeaway, or, or you can make it a little pizza, and you make it special about putting the bottle of champagne, and you just have that with your friend, your wife, your husband. So I, I get a lot of some people would say, like, sort of talking down champagne. Champagne should be with caviar. Right. Yes, of course, it's, it's brilliant, 
And on a Friday night, I don't have a kilo of caviar waiting for me at home. My Conte cheese with my glass of Bruxelles, I think I'm feeling, I'm happy to be home and I'm having a great tasting experience. And, and I, I like this keep, keeping, keep it simple moments. I mean, it's all relative with champagne to keep it simple, but at the end of the day, it's wine and cheese. So I can't get it wrong with that. Thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. I mean, this is like Billy said, we've gone well over a hundred episodes and didn't get to feature a producer from Champagne. So we're proud that you were the first to join us and folks have a lot to live up to now. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Th- we'll, we'll stay in touch and hopefully we'll next time uh, we have you on, we'll have some of your wines here and we'll be able to taste them together and uh, we'll do it again soon. That was like a plan. Thank you so okay. much. All right. That was our interview with Mathieu Roland Bilkart. I hope everybody learned something about Bilkart Samon that they might not have before. I think they're, they're four, I, I, the four different types of their portfolio they have. I think they call it their four Savoie. It's, I thought that was really interesting. So now I was excited to go out and buy some Bilkart after this or Bilkart. I hope you are as well. But that is the end of this episode. So until the next episode, cheers. <music>